Welcome back to Conversations with Great Minds with Jeffrey Smith. Jeffrey has been described as the leading world expert in the understanding and communication of the health issues surrounding genetically modified foods. He's the author of numerous critically acclaimed books on genetically modified foods, including Genetic Roulette, the Documented Health Risks of Genetically Engineered Foods. Let's get back to it. Um, we talked about celiac disease, intolerance, allergies. These, all these things are exploding. Autism is something that has been really in the headlines recently. Uh, back 20, 30 years ago, it was one in several thousand children. Now it's one in several hundred children. 88. One in 88 yeah. born in the autistic spectrum. Some of that apparently is the consequence of better detection or you know changes in our definitions of what is and what isn't autism. But that can't account for more than a very, very small percentage of that change. And there's all the speculation, you know, the mercury, the tamarisol, all these other things. You're suggesting that genetically modified organisms may be connected to this? I think it may be a contributor, but many scientists and doctors also agree. In fact, in my film coming out called Genetic Roulette, it will be out in August, we interview three different parents, including a medical doctor, that took their kids off of genetically modified foods and saw changes in behavior and gastrointestinal distress. Hmm. One of the scientists that I work with gave a talk in Germany and described the behavioral, physiological, and neurological changes in laboratory animals and livestock that were fed genetically modified feed. And an autism specialist came up to him afterwards and said, these are exactly what we're seeing in autistic children. The gastrointestinal problems, the gut right. permeability, the changes in the bacterial balance and behavioral changes are found in the rats, in the mice, in the pigs, in the cows that they've been tested. And now in our kids. In our kids. And now in our kids. And, and is this in utero exposure or after Birth we haven't gotten that far. I mean, through breast milk, or? it's it's hard to say. We do know that um, inside the uh, in utero, you have the BT toxin and the Roundup. They both pass through the, yeah, the we know in, that. into the amniotic fluid. Pass pass and the placenta. And of course, the blood-brain barrier is not well developed yeah. at all. And so, if things like if if the BT toxin, which breaks open pores in human cells, if that gets in the brain, we have no idea if that's going to be leading to developmental disorders. Now, in our last segment, I asked you if there was a control group against which the, the United States could be measured. And I'm trying said, to be on a control and, group and, by avoiding <laughs> GMOs myself. Well, good on you. Yeah. I, I don't know how to do it, and, that, and we want to get, I want to get to that in a minute right. because this is one of the big problems here in America. And, but in any case, you said Europe. Uh, what's the status of GMOs in Europe? Well, the person who did this potato study was gagged and fired and threatened within two days of going public with his findings. But after seven months, he was invited to speak before Parliament. The gag order was lifted. A firestorm erupted. He was a European scientist? A European scientist. Okay. He, had been, he had been hired to figure out how to test for the safety of GMOs, so he was an insider. When his gag order was lifted in, in, April, in February of 1999, within 10 weeks, the tipping point of consumer rejection was achieved because using GMOs had become a marketing liability. So, Kraft, Unilever, Nestle's, the, ba the major food companies have all removed GM ingredients from the European brands, but not in the U.S., where most people are unaware. Wow. So was Europe for some period of time using GMO foods? Yes. Is it possible to see, you know, a, a change in, in, in that, you know, over time that, that correlates to that with things like, you know, autism or IBS or whatever? We did see that soon after GM soy was introduced to the UK, soy allergy skyrocketed by 50% in a single year. What year was that? This was in 1999, okay. just before they removed it. Right. And in the article that came out, the York Laboratory was saying this could implicate genetically engineered soy. But I think the government stepped in and they wouldn't release the report and they stopped uh, speaking about it. It's the same government that jumped on Arpad Pustai who discovered the problems with the potatoes. Remarkable. Um, India. Yes. has uh, had a, uh, apparently a real problem with GMO products, and, and that problem has been more economic. I mean, we've been talking medical here. Well, and, there's and medical too there. Well, I, I'm a, yeah, I'm yeah. assuming that there's that as well, but uh, Deepak Chopra said that using GMOs are risking our extinction, extinction as a species. He was talking about right. medical. Uh, Vandana Shiva has, has just done some brilliant work on the, on, the, on the thousands, tens of thousands of farmers who are committing suicide. A quarter of a million. Quarter of a million. Quarter of a million farmers, according to Vandana Shiva, have committed suicide, and she says at least three quarters are due to BT cotton, genetically engineered cotton, engineered to produce the BT toxin to kill insects. Now, basically, so what's, called, how, what's the relationship between that and suicide? Okay, they they borrow heavily to buy the more expensive seeds and associated chemicals, 
the BT cotton is unreliable. And when it doesn't even pay back enough to allow the people to pay their loans, they commit suicide. They're going to have to lose the land. Hmm. And they have found about 95 out of 100 homes where they knock on the doors and say, what's the cause of the suicide? It's BT cotton. And there was leaked documents from the government which has always said, oh, it's not BT cotton. But the documents now say, in fact, it is BT cotton. Why? Why, why, why would BT cotton be any different than, you know, regular cotton and why wouldn't the farmers just grow regular cotton? Right now it's impossible to even get regular cotton in many of the districts because Monsanto has basically taken over the market making it virtually impossible to find it. It's a monopoly? Yes. How do, how do they achieve that? Well they purchase it, they also went to extensive lengths of advertising and disinforming. So they had Bollywood actors, spiritual leaders, etc., converting the minds of the people, saying, oh, you're going to make a lot of money and a lot of money. So even though independent research was tracking a reduction in income, Monsanto was claiming just the opposite and broadcasting that to the farmers. So they were basically twisting their arm to get them to invest in the seeds that were going to make them rich, and a lot of them committed suicide. And this is ongoing. Oh, yeah. In addition, people, when they pick the cotton, are getting itching and rashing all over their, rashes all over their bodies. And when they allow animals to graze on the cotton plants after harvest, many of the animals die. I visited one village where they had allowed their buffalo to graze on normal cotton plants for eight years. They allowed them to graze on BT cotton plants for a single day, and all 13 buffalo die. And the BT plants have a built-in insecticide. insecticide, which is arguably a poison. Right. Given, given all this, Yes. Why aren't Americans more outraged? Because Americans have been disinformed. You may have, you may have said it earlier, feed the world through GMOs. The experts don't think so. No one really believes it. In fact, GMOs actually reduce yield. But if you ask the average American, because $250 million at the turn of the century was spent on convincing Americans that GMOs were needed to feed the growing population. But the argument Yield, my understanding is that the main argument of GMOs historically has not been yield. It's well, been that, you know, this crop will grow just as well as any other crop, but it's been genetically engineered to have its own antibiotic in it or its own uh, anti, anti uh, in, its own insecticide, and therefore it's less expensive to grow because you don't have to pour insecticide on it. Or in Roundup Ready, for example, Roundup Ready, uh, you know, you can use Roundup, which is a herbicide, nukes weeds, right. and, but, uh, well, actually, describe Roundup Ready. What, what is the okay. story with this? So, sci scientists found bacteria growing near Monsanto's factory that wasn't dying in the presence of Roundup herbicide. It was in a chemical waste dump. Right. And they figured, great, let's put it in the food supply. So they took the gene that allowed the bacterium to survive Roundup, took it out and put it into soybeans. Now you can spray Roundup over a field of soybeans and all of the other plant biodiversity dies, but not the soybeans. So you can have a completely clean field with no weeds and if you go down to Argentina there's miles and miles of basically sterile outdoors. Whereas normally if you sprayed Roundup on a bunch of soybeans they would die they would along die. with all the other weeds as well. Right. So now we're ingesting Roundup. Is it, it's, it's worse than that because the Roundup actually is now is thought to be creating a proliferation of a new type of organism that may be linked to miscarriages and infertility. A group of scientists wrote a letter to Tom Vilsack, which was leaked onto the internet, the Secretary of Agriculture, right. and des described how this organism, when isolated, when it was uh, exposed to pregnant chickens, it killed the embryo within 48 hours. When they have ranches or farms with high levels of miscarriages, they look at the aborted fetal tissue, and they're packed with this new organism, which is also on the By feed, which has, been, which has been treated with Roundup. By organism, are you talking about a bacteria? It's new to science. It's the size of a virus, so it's only seen under an electron microscope. It's never been characterized before. Now, you know, viruses are those weird kind of in-between where we're not though. sure if it's alive and we're not sure it's not because they don't, they don't uh, excrete, they don't uh, metabolize, yeah. they do, you know, it's basically DNA This is not a virus though. This is not a virus. It's not a, it's not a lot of things. It's probably something like a, uh, a fungus that's a microfungus, but they've never seen it before. They're isolating the DNA right now. Whoa. Whoa. I know. I mean, it, it gets stranger than truth. Um, there are those who suggest that all of this is just a uh, byproduct of globalization. How do you respond to that? Well, what I've seen traveling to 34 countries is the, that Monsanto like surfs on globalization and corrupts and captures governments all over. So it's not just the byproduct. I'd say it's an epitome of an incredible global takeover. 
when you look at the speech that was given by Monsanto's consultant, Arthur Anderson, in 1999, January, they described that the ideal future of Monsanto's executives was a world in which 100% of all commercial seeds were genetically engineered and patented and had Monsanto's associated chemicals sold alongside that. And they created the plan to create the strategy and tactics to achieve that ideal future within 15 to 20 years. Amazing. So this is, is, it, is this just Monsanto? Are there other companies involved? Monsanto, in Syngenta, Dow, DuPont, and Bayer, the five major GM wow. crops. Tell me what gene drift is. Gene drift. I plant over here, my pollen comes up, doesn't read the sign that says do not spray, it's non-GMO, comes over, uh, cross-pollinates with your plants, or the seeds blow over. Right. Or a passing truck comes and delivering canola seeds and the wind blows and it ends up on your farm. There's no coexistence that's possible because nature has figured out a way to spread her bounty over centuries and millennia. And, and, this, and this gene drift is not just a problem with soybeans to soybeans. No, I mean, there's lots of other stuff growing around those Canola things. to mustard, canola to broccoli, uh, relatives, wild relatives and domestic relatives, uh, sugar beets to chart. Right. So, and it, and it may, and it could just as easily go to things that we don't eat, but other parts of the ecosystem eat to the, to the grasses or what we would call weeds that the rabbits are eating. And now try and recall it. Impossible. You, you it's a self-propagating pollution and gene pool. Oh, you can't recall the you gene because recall. once it's in yeah. nature, it's in nature. Exactly. So it's, it's going to go beyond the effects of global warming, beyond nuclear waste. It's, at this point in our science, it's permanent, self-propagating pollution. So what do we do? We have a little less than a minute left here. First of all, we have to cap it. Right now, the good news is this. We know from Europe, even a small percentage of consumers avoiding GMOs can drive it out of the market with a tipping point. So we're educating people at responsibletechnology.org with information that changes people's diet and at, at non-gmoshoppingguide.com, you can learn how to avoid GMOs. But in now, there's a labeling initiative in California where if it wins in November, GMOs will be labeled. 53% of Americans say they would avoid GMOs if labeled. We think, I think, that the companies would rather eliminate GMOs than admit they use them. So winning in California is essential right now. Amazing. And, and spreading the word. Um, yes. Jeffrey, thanks so much. Thank for you so much, Tom.